Last week we were in Genesis chapter 32 and we're going to be in Genesis chapter 33 today. Um, We looked last week at Jacob's preparation for meeting his estranged brother Esau and then the wrestling match that he had with God where God permanently wrenched his hip to remind him to trust in God instead of himself for as long as Jacob lived. During that chapter and during that wrestling event, God also gave Jacob a new name, the name of Israel. And you see God doing that very often in the Old Testament, and once in a while Jesus did it. You remember he renamed Simon and he called him Peter. But in the Old Testament, you see God assigning new names to people to give new meaning to what their life was supposed to be about. You saw Abram become Abraham. And to this day, we call Abram Abraham. We almost, even when we're talking about Abraham before he became Abraham, we call him Abraham. But Jacob is a different story. Jacob gets a new name, Israel, and when you and I think of him, what do we call him today? Jacob. We think of Israel only in terms of the nation. We don't think of Israel as the person who used to be Jacob. And it's kind of interesting because even in the scriptures, There are 45 times after he has been renamed Israel that the scriptures themselves refer to him as Jacob. And only 23 times that the scriptures refer to Jacob as Israel. And there's a reason for that. Jacob was one of those characters that just had a really hard time figuring out who he wanted to be, whether he wanted to be Jacob or whether he wanted to be Israel. (laughs) Whether he wanted to be the old person before conversion or whether he wanted to be the Israel who had struggled with God and was victorious. And Jacob just, he he just struggled with that all kind of the way through his life. (laughs) Spiritual maturity does indeed come easier for some people than others. But for all people, it is a process. And for all people, it does come. It has to come to a point where you and I make a decision that we want our new identity in Christ more than we want the old identity before Christ. And at some point or another, we have to get to that point. So, I want us to just look at the scripture, and I am going to read all of it today. It's about 20 verses there in uh, chapter 33. Jacob looked up, and there he saw Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in the front. He put Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph at the last. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother Esau. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Then Esau looked up, and he saw the women and the children, and he said, Who are these with you? Jacob answered, These are the children God has graciously given your servant. Then the female servants and their children approached and bowed down. Next, Leah and her children came and bowed down. Last of all, Joseph and Rachel, and they too bowed down. Esau asked, What's the meaning of all these flocks and herds I met? To find favor in your eyes, my lord, he said. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob. If I have found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God. Now that you have received me favorably. 
Please accept this present that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted it. Then Esau said, let us be on our way. I'll accompany you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are tender and that I must care for the ewes and the cows that are nursing their young. If they are driven hard just one day, all the animals will die. So let my Lord go on ahead of his servant while I move along slowly at a pace of the flocks and herds before me and the pace of the children until I come to my Lord in Sierra. Esau said, then let me leave some men, some of my men with you. But why do that, Jacob asked. Just let me find favor in the eyes of my Lord. So that day Esau started on his way back to Seir. Jacob, however, went to Succoth, where he built a place for himself and made shelters for his livestock. That is why the place is called Succoth. After Jacob came from Padan and Aram, he arrived safely at the city of Shechem in Canaan and camped within the site of the city. For a hundred pieces of silver he bought from the sons of Hamar, he bought from the sons of Hamar, the father of Shechem, the plot of ground where he pitched his tent. There he set up an altar and called it El Elohi Israel. Let's pray. Father God, take this scripture, your holy word, and speak it to our hearts where we need to have it spoken to today. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to go ahead and just give a brief summary of this passage again. Um, Jacob sees Esau and his 400 men coming towards him. So Jacob sets out his family in kind of a parade with himself in the front and his favorite wife and her son in the very back. And as he approaches to Esau... As he sees him, he bows seven different times before his elder brother. Esau surprises everyone. He surprises us. He should be very angry still. But he runs to his brother and he embraces Jacob and he kisses him. And he asks about the family, Jacob's family. And Jacob says, well, these are the children. This is the family God has given to me. And Jacob's family all comes and bows down then before Esau. And Esau asks about the procession of the gifts, all those animals and flocks and herds that, that Jacob had sent ahead to kind of soften Esau's heart towards him. And Jacob admits that they were sent just to win his favor. And Esau tells Jacob, well, why don't you just keep them because uh, I've got everything I need. I'm content with what I have. But Jacob insists and says, just keep them as a favor um, and, and so Esau keeps him as a gift. Then Esau invites Jacob to travel back with him and go to, to Jacob, or Esau's home. And Jacob says, well, you know, he just kind of fibs. He says, uh, well, my, my family and my animals need to go really slow. And in fact, he, he goes so far as to say, they're all going to die if I push them one day too hard. <laughs> I think probably Esau caught on to that. Um, <laughs> and then Esau offers to just have some men travel with them. And Jacob says, no, you go on ahead. I'll catch up to you. But es or J Jacob never does. He just turns around, goes a a another direction, and he settles in, in um, Succoth, and sets up tents and, and lives there for a while. And then he moves to Shechem, and, which is in Canaan, where God had told him to go, but is not to the place in Canaan where God had sent him to. And he bought some land there um, and settled there. And this whole chapter covers about eight to ten years in the life of Jacob. I want us to think a little bit first about Esau. Esau had every right to seek revenge against Jacob. Even though 20 years had passed. First, Jacob had taken advantage of Esau's hunger 
and traded a bowl of stew for Esau's birthright. That may not sound all that important to us, but it's everything. It's, it's the family inheritance. And the oldest son got two-thirds of the inheritance in any family in, in that culture in that day. And so for him to trade that bowl of soup for that inheritance was absolutely huge. And Jacob had cheated him out of his inheritance. But secondly, Jacob had tricked his father into giving him Esau's blessing. And the blessing was all about the family legacy and the family honor and all of that. And, it, and that was a really important thing too. And Jacob got that too. And then there's Jacob who has spent his whole life running from all of his problems or devising a man-made scheme to overcome his problems. He's never really trusted God before this very much. And here we have him facing his past, and he's facing Esau, and here he is after he's wrestled with God now, he's trying to figure out what it means to follow God and be changed by God, and yet deal with his past. <laughs> and so he's partially trusting God here while he's learning to be Isaac. Now, there's a number of ways, and I want to help you see those this morning. There's a number of ways at which Jacob is successful at being Isaac in this story. First, he had indeed attempted restitution even though it was for his own protection. I mean, he sent all these gifts ahead and in some ways that is a form of restitution trying to make right the wrong he had done before to Esau. And so he was sending all of these gifts and if Esau is going to come, he was going to make sure to soften his heart some before he got there. And so in a sense, he's making restitution. Now I want to say a few words about restitution. We should, of course, make genuine attempts at repairing any damage you and I have done to other people. Giving gifts or giving property, however, cannot atone entirely for slander <laughs> or damaging someone's safety or self-esteem or honor. And when you and I try to make restitution, that is something we should do, but we also should not just expect that the other person is obligated to forgive us just because we have attempted to make restitution. That's on them. You can't just expect people to respond to your attempt to make restitution right away. And yet those gifts of restitution may be the very best demonstration that you and I can, can make to try to make something right with someone that we have hurt. And so here Jacob is, he's making a form of restitution to his brother Esau. And that is something that God can do in our hearts. He can bring us to that point where we want to make things right where we have made mistakes and sinned against other people. Restitution is not something we hear about much in the church anymore. But it is something that you find throughout the scriptures and it's very important that we do what we can to make things right with the people that we have hurt. Secondly, Jacob has a newfound courage in the way he deals with his past. In the past, if Jacob was going to meet his brother Esau, he would have put his family way out there in front, and he'd have been way back here somewhere, way back there. He'd have sacrificed all kinds of people around. He'd have sacrificed his family to protect himself. But you see what Jacob is doing here. All of a sudden, Jacob is saying, no, I'm going to own this. I'm the one that injured my brother. 
I'm the one that hurt him, and I'm going to put myself out there, <laughs> up there at the front. I'm going to be the one that meets Esau, and my family I'm going to protect behind me. And that is a step in which Jacob is actually living up to his new name, Israel. The other thing, another thing that he does is he bows down before his brother seven times. Now, seven in the Old Testament, especially in the Old Testament, also in the New Testament, is the number for God. It's the number for completion. It, it's, a, it's a significant number. And so he is going and he's really emphasizing the fact that he's bowing seven times before Esau to emphasize that he is genuinely trying to be humble before his brother. So he expresses that humility before his older brother. And then when they meet, he, and, and, and Esau wants to know, who, who, who are all these people? He gives God credit. And you've never heard this kind of language come out of Jacob before. He was always taking care of himself. He was always scheming. But here you see Jacob say to his brother Esau, these are the family, these are the children that God has graciously given to me. I didn't deserve them. But God has given this family to me. You see Jacob have a change in the way he talks. There is grace and there is favor on his tongue. You see four different times when he talks about how God has blessed him and given him favor and grace. And then there is generosity that arrives in the life of Jacob. And, and you know, he'd sent those gifts kind of to soften Esau's heart. But when he discovered that Esau's heart was already soft... He could have clutched them back. And especially when Esau said, I have no need for those. I, I am just fine. I'm content with what I have and all of that. Um, Jacob went ahead and said, no, you keep them. And he was emphatic about that. Faith loosens the grip of greed in our lives. Jacob had stolen Esau's blessing, but now Jacob says, please accept these as a gift. Please accept this as a blessing to you from me. I stole your blessing. This is my blessing to you. And so he gives that to him. We're going to find out here that Jacob didn't handle this whole parting as well as he should have. But one of the other good things that he did is he did not return to Seir with Esau. God had not told him to go to Seir. God had told him to go back to meet his brother, to deal with his past, and then God had told him to go to Bethel and God would bless him. So when Esau invites him to go back home with him and to fellowship with him there at Seir, Jacob is actually living as Israel there, and he says, no, I can't do that. But just as he doesn't do that, he acts like Jacob and lies about why he's not. <laughs> and tells him, uh, I even though he had no intention of doing that. Have you ever done that? <laughs> just couldn't quite bring yourself to just spill out the truth. <laughs> and, and Jacob's not going home with Esau, but he just couldn't tell him that. And so he says, I will catch up to you. You go on ahead, I'll catch up to you. I will catch up to you in Sierra. <laughs> and so while they embraced and they reconciled. I want you to notice that they did not have continued fellowship because it would not have been mutually beneficial. And this is a key teaching that you should not miss because you won't hear it very often. Just because Forgiveness has happened, 
and you have been reconciled in your relationship does not mean you should hang out together. Just because forgiveness has happened and you've been reconciled doesn't mean you should be best friends anymore. Just because you've been reconciled and you've forgiven each other and all of that does not mean you should live in the same town anymore. That is not, sometimes we get this idea that once we're forgiven and we've forgiven each other and we're reconciled that we ought to just be best buddies. God wanted them to reconcile. He forced them to reconcile, and then God said, now separate. Because even though we may be reconciled with somebody, that does not mean that we're good for each other. And God wants us to be mutually beneficial. And you have to think about what is good for me long term. I might, if you've hurt me, I might forgive you, but that doesn't mean I may hang out with you a lot. And you vice versa. And so there's that wisdom there. And you find that here in this story where, you know, God wanted them to reconcile and deal with their past, which Esau already had. But he wanted Jacob to deal with his past. But then he didn't send him on to live with um, Esau. Now I want to talk to you about Esau for just a little bit. Esau is an interesting character because he's really a pagan. He doesn't worship the God of his father. He doesn't worship the God of his grandfather, Abraham. He doesn't worship the God of his brother, Jacob. And yet, in this story, he is a picture of a model pagan. And he is the picture of the forgiveness of God towards us. Jesus, actually, when he tells us the story of the prodigal son, he actually quotes word for word out of this story. When he says, and the father ran to the prodigal son and embraced him and kissed him. (laughs) Ran, embraced, and kissed That's why Jacob says to Esau, he said, when you, when I saw your face, it was like the face of God. When I found that I had your favor, because Jacob had spent 20 years in fear of Esau. And when Jacob saw Esau running towards him, wanting to embrace him, And he felt that forgiveness. It was like knowing the forgiveness of God. And so he named that place Peniel, as as we've already talked about. So even though Esau is not a God follower, I want you to notice that Esau, on his own, without really the influence of God in his life, had done something that so often is so hard for us. He had chosen sometime in that 20 years, and I have no idea whether it was in the first year or in the 20th year, but sometime in that process, Esau had forgiven Jacob for all the horrible things Jacob had done to him. And he did that so that he could move on with his own life. Esau forgave Jacob for his own sake. He did not forgive Jacob because Jacob deserved it. Jacob did not deserve it. He did not forgive Jacob because Jacob had changed. During those 20 years, Jacob didn't change until the very end. He did not forgive Jacob because Jacob had repented. Jacob had not repented. Jacob had not sent any restitution earlier than this. Esau just made his mind up that he had to move on and he could not live in the bitterness and and all of the things that were piling up in his soul towards his brother. And he did that as a pagan. 
So even though Esau had forgiven Jacob, here's something else very interesting in the story, he was not naive about who Jacob was. He had forgiven Jacob, and you say, well, if he's forgiven him, why does he bring 400 men with him? Because he had forgiven him, but he also wasn't naive about Jacob. <laughs> and he knew that Jacob maybe hadn't changed, and when they met, Jacob might come to do him harm, and Esau is too smart for that. Esau comes prepared for the worst behavior in Jacob. He's ready. There's another lesson in forgiveness. Just because you forgive someone does not mean that you can be naive about them. There is nothing in Scripture that tells you to forgive and become naive. And yet sometimes that is the message we hear in the church. No. Esau forgave, but he was not naive about Jacob and who he was. And he came prepared to deal with the person that he last knew. But he gave Jacob every chance in the world. Because when he came, he didn't send the men out. <laughs> he ran to his brother first. He embraced. He kissed him. They wept together. He gave his brother the best chance, but he also was not naive. Fortunately, Esau was able to embrace Jacob. Esau is very content with his life. He doesn't feel the need for Jacob's herds or flocks, and he receives them as a gift. But the sad thing about Esau is that he never did show an interest in Jacob's God. Now, I want to go back, and I'm, I'm sorry I've kind of flipped you back and forth between the two men, and I'm going back to Jacob, and I'm going to talk to you about some mistakes that Jacob made in this whole process. This is part of the reason that we, we know him as Jacob instead of Israel. Because Jacob continued in his Jacob ruts. <laughs> Even after he'd wrestled with God, he made some poor choices. First of all, he does not tell Esau the truth. He says, I will catch up to you in Sierra. Yes, I will. <laughs> and he turns right around and goes the other direction. Deceit is still one of those things that Jacob wrestles with. Jacob did not obey God and go to Bethel in Canaan. He went to Canaan, but he didn't go to Bethel. Instead, he went to Succoth, and he set up shelters for his animals. And then he goes to Shechem in Canaan. Again, he's in Canaan, but he's not in Bethel where God told him to go. He was really close to obeying, and yet he was disobedient. He followed God without really surrendering his will to God. Growing up on the dairy farm up in Butler, South Dakota, we only had one quarter of land that we owned and another quarter that we rented, and, and those two quarters kind of provided and kept the cows fed all year that we milked. And... Um, we, we had a cow. We, all of our cows were named... And, and I, I can't remember the name of this cow. Um, I probably changed her name a couple times. <laughs> because this cow never left the farm. But she was never where she was supposed to be. Even when she was over the fence, and most of the time she was, she stayed on our property. She didn't wander off into the neighbors. She didn't cross the road or anything else. She would be in our ditch. She'd be anywhere on our property. She was always ready to come back to get milked morning and night. 
But as soon as you let her out, she'd go find a fence and leap across the fence, break the fence down, cut up her bag, and we'd have to do surgery on her every time she came back in to be milked. Her bag was always cut up, and there was always a fence that needed repaired, and, you know, that cow didn't last real long with us before we got tired of it. <laughs> but the cow never left our place. It just was never where it was supposed to be on our place. <laughs> just had to be across the fence. And occasionally, sometimes we're like that, and I'm like that, where, you know, I know where God has set the boundaries here for me, but I, and I'm going to stay close to home. I'm not going to be one of those people that had way off. But I'm going to stay close to home, but I just got to be on the other side of the fence. <laughs> and it's never good for us. It was never good for the cow to be on the other side of the fence. She had plenty of good grass on our side of the fence. It didn't help her at all. Sometimes we can be so close to obedience but we're not obeying. That was Jacob. Then notice this. Jacob is wise. He, he avoids the pagan influence of his brother Esau. He avoids the pagan influence of Seir and the people who live there. But what does he do? He moves his family right into the pagan influence of Shechem. And in the next chapter, you see how it totally destroys his family. So he avoids the pagan influence over here, and he moves his family into this pagan influence, Instead of going to the place where God said, Jacob, if you will move to Bethel, I will provide for your family and I will protect your family. But Jacob goes over here to Shechem. And he settles where God had told him not to settle. So as we close this morning, there's... there's two themes that kind of flow through this, this story. And maybe there's another one that God is speaking to you about this morning outside of these. But are you, are, are you wrestling between being Jacob and Israel? Your old life and the new life that God wants you to possess and to take charge of and to inhabit God wants each one of us to move from the old to the new. He wants us to take root deep in the Christian life that he's calling us to. He doesn't want us to wrestle back and forth. But it is a process. But in that process, some point along the way, there needs to be that time when you and I just surrender our lives and say, okay, God, I'm really tired of being Jacob. And I want to be Israel. And then I want to ask you, have you come under the protection of God that comes through obedience to him? Not almost obedience. Not just the wrong side of the fence obedience. But have you come under the protection of God that comes through obedience? Obedience is always the very best thing for us. You see, it's not helping God so much when we obey. It's helping us. It's good for us when we obey him. That's the key to obedience. And the question is, have you come under the protection of God by surrendering your will obey him.